Okay, so so let me get into the meat here because uh, to be to be perfectly honest, I view the substitution of a computer for the market me mechanism to be magical thinking, to be pretty disingenuous because it seems like an answer. I don't actually think that it is because computers don't do anything, right? They just sit there passively waiting for instructions. So somebody's going to have to code the algorithm that uh, that uh, sends the goods out. Now, if there's if nobody wants anything more than what is available then whether you have the Venus Project system or a complete free market is immaterial. In fact, I would say the complete free market is if you can limit people's desires through rational argument, through appeals to happiness rather than stimulus, then you, you don't need the central computer, you don't need a centralized overhead of management, you don't need the risk of that becoming totalitarian, you can just have a free market where people are limiting their own desires. The risk of a totalitarian state developing out of resource-based economy is no greater than the risk with free market capitalism, wherein difference in capacity to produce, coupled with difference in demand of particular products and services naturally engenders disparity in purchasing power. When technology is used to create abundance, there is nothing to be gained from withholding resources that cannot also be gained in a free market where holding as a bargaining strategy is the norm. The difference being that, in a resource-based economy, the hoarding of money will not affect availability or value of resources. So, if your argument, and I think my argument, is correct that we can philosophically, through reason and evidence, limit people's desires for ridiculous consumption, then a free market system will handle that perfectly. If, uh, if we can't, in other words, if people want more than is available to the general population, then uh, I think the free market begins to price that higher and higher to the point where people die off because uh, their desires will die off. Because parents, for instance, don't want their children to be buying all of this stuff. And so in a, a school system, I would send my kids in a free market school system, I would send my kids to a school if schools even existed in the way that they do now, which I doubt, but let's say they do. I would send my daughter to a school which taught her that, you know, stuff is not going to make you happy and, and you, you know, what matters is human connection and love and, and a reasonable amount of material comfort and so on. Because parents don't want to spend all of this stuff, uh, all of this money on this garbage that just accumulates and causes fights and frustrations and, you know, lasts for 10 seconds after which the kids just want to play in the box the toy came in. So I think that there will be a countervailing uh, desire on the part of parents and on the part of educational institu uh, uh, institutions to limit people's desires. If they limit people's desires successfully, a free market system will perfectly handle that and accept that. So help me to understand how the central computer in a very practical way, and this is this comes from my business training and experience, you have to not use adjectives, uh, you have to use proof, right? I can't just come up with a business plan that says, you know, give me half a million dollars and we'll all make lots of money and uh, it will be really efficient and profitable because those are just adjectives. Help me to understand how people, not computers, because computers will only do what people tell them, how a small group of people will allocate these resources to everybody else. Okay. If you live in Florida, you don't need winter underwear. It depends on where people live. If 4,000 people live in Arizona, that's the amount of clothing you have to supply. If you have a ship company and you've got 5,000 passengers, that tells you how many cooks you need, how much water you need for showers and baths. You can get that statistic. No ship company says, I think I'll put four gallons there. They do a statistical study. They don't, if you have an airplane that carries 400 passengers, that tells you how much food you need, how much water you need. Nobody says, well, if you ask me, I will think I'll put in four gallons of water. Well, I was thinking more along... Statistical long... mechanics yeah. decides what we do, not fresco. In other words, if you have a state with 40,000 people in it, but the state has enough land to feed 20,000, you'll have to move most of them out of that state. It has to be, everything has to be in accordance with the carrying capacity of the environment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, that means no one makes decisions except the survey committee. The survey committee doesn't make decisions, but tells you what we have and what we don't have. After agreement is attained by nations to move toward unification and sharing of the Earth's resources, a global survey of available resources, technical personnel,
production plants, arable land, etc. has to be done to provide us with sufficient information to ascertain the parameters of social design. During the initial phase, the cybernated system being developed will serve as a data bank to tell us what is available. This will enable us to proceed with the design. The major initial task will be to provide food, water, shelter, medical care, and clean sources of energy. Although many ideas will be submitted, the methods of selecting will be based upon energy determinants, or the required energy to produce a given product. There will be many materials that will not be readily available. Research departments throughout the world will be assigned the tasks of developing alternative systems and materials to overcome shortages. One must remember that the research and development does not depend on funding, and resources will be assigned where most needed, so development will be tremendously accelerated. Interdisciplinary teams of qualified personnel, in line with the project's requirements, will work on automated systems to produce and supply goods and services on a massive scale. These can be the armies of the future, a large peaceful mobilization to restore and preserve the earth and its people. This has never been done before and can only be done when money is no obstacle. The question is not, do we have the money? But, do we have the resources and means to pursue this new direction? Okay, um, well, I guess you know, as we, we, we went into that a little bit and I talked about how it's easier, we've already been over that, it's much easier to calculate it when there's far less variables. One of the, I think one of the, the, the issues of the variables is what I was talking about when I brought up all the issues of how consumers are created. Those are the irrational quote-unquote variables. Let's say that uh, people's desires are limited. Uh, I understand that. Uh, so okay. how is it that, that uh, resources are allocated? Um, well, uh, the systems approach that was laid out in Z3 seems to be pretty steady. I mean, uh, do you do you want me to go over it all over all over again, or I mean, well, it, look, f first of all, all of that stuff came out of the free market, and all of that stuff is involved with with pricing, right? So, uh, I mean, I am not by any means a massive brain spanning expert on this, but my last job in the software industry before I did this full time was uh, dealing with a company that produced algorithms to help. Companies organize uh, their resource uh, consumption, allocation, and purchases entirely based upon an analysis of price versus uh, versus profit, the cost of production versus the profit that could be made by selling it to the consumer. And I, I can absolutely tell you for, without a shadow of a doubt that if price were not available, all of those calculations would be meaningless. So in the absence of price, in the absence of price, what, uh, how, uh, how is, uh, how are goods... Um, uh, right. Well, that's yeah, and, and I'm and I'm trying to get through that. I was that's why I asked you if you understood the concept of systems theory. Do you understand the concept that we presented as far as strategic access? Distribution of goods and services without the use of money or tokens would be accomplished by establishing distribution centers. These centers would be similar to expositions, where the advantages of new products are explained and demonstrated. Exhibition centers will display what is new and available and will constantly be updated. If you visited Yellowstone National Park for instance, you could check out a camera or camcorder, use it, and then return it to another distribution center or drop off, eliminating storage and maintenance. Besides computerized centers throughout the communities where products would eventually be displayed, there will be 3D flat screen imaging in each home. If you desire an item, an order can be placed and the item automatically delivered directly to your place of residence without a price tag, servitude, or debt of any kind. This includes whatever people need such as housing, clothing, education, health care, entertainment, etc. Raw materials for products can be transported directly to manufacturing facilities by automated transportation sequences using boats, monorails, maglev trains, pipelines and pneumatic tubes. An automated computerized inventory system would integrate the distribution centers and manufacturing facilities, coordinating production to meet demand. In this way, a balanced load economy can be maintained. Shortages, overruns, and waste could be eliminated. I look. I understand that um, uh, that there is going to be a, a number of goods that are available that people can check in and check out uh, of a sort of library. Is is that the idea? 
Oh, that's a similar concept, yes. But it's essentially, it's just, they're already doing this today with things like car banks and such. You don't need to own a car. You need access to a car for, like, generally maybe 30 minutes out of a given day, depending on where you're going. Um, that's if you Sure, don't and just, just, just to remind you, though, that the calculation price. problem is not around consumption, it's around production. Consumption rates of a given resource, along with availability and degree of necessity of production for comfortable survival, will factor into determining when and how much of something needs to be produced. The question is whether, whether how many cars do you produce, of what kind, and, and do you produce cars relative to the other million things that you could produce? Only the price mechanism. Again, just to point, the fact that it exists within a price system, right? Those cars only exist because of the price system, at least according to Austrian economic theory, which I think is, is valid. So um, saying, well, that the capitalist system has produced all of this stuff, which will then take over for a non-capitalist system, to me, is, is not correct. The computers that you talk about, the, uh, I think in Zeitgeist, Peter mentions that these systems are already in place for retail distribution outlets. But these systems only exist because of the price system, because of the efficiency of the price system. So uh, my question is, you know, how does it work in the absence of of a price system, taking over technology that has been produced by the free market for a non-free market environment uh, is, to me, just saying the free market works. I don't really, well, I guess the it's kind of a matter of not reinventing the wheel. I'm not necessarily saying, you know, it, as far as it, it, the point is, is that you could use all of those same technologies to keep track of inventory and then decide what to produce accordingly. Companies already do this when they decide how much they're going to produce of a given item. Sometimes yes, there's- Yes, but sorry, just to reiterate, but that's that's only because they have price. If well, you take price out of the equation, those systems don't work. I mean, I've I've spent quite a bit of time uh, working within these systems uh, from a software entrepreneur standpoint. If you take price out of the equation, you have no way of of gauging or comparing the cost of production for producing any particular good or service, particularly when compared to all of the possible goods and services, and even more particularly for trying to figure out what to build in the future, right? Because entrepreneurs uh, say, okay, well, if I combine all of these resources, which cost, you know, 500 bucks, then I can sell an iPad three years from now for $550. And uh, without uh, costs of production, without costs of comparison, uh, th which are all reflected automatically and for free in the price system, because you just look stuff up on eBay to figure out how much it costs, Without the price mechanism, not only can you not figure out what to produce in the present, even more importantly, you can't figure out what to produce in the future. And uh, I assume that economic growth is not going to stop and innovation is not going to stop in the, in the future. Resource economy is not expected to grow. It increases in efficiency with technical innovation. If economic innovation were to stop completely, Statistical analysis would still provide objective data as regards material resources needed for survival. Well, no, and I and I recognize what you're talking about. I would I would point out though that um, I don't necessarily agree that Mises's theory about the lack of our ability to tackle the price problem is empirical. I don't think that that's an absolute. I think that it can be overcome. Um, and I, I I understand. I mean, you know, you're repeating and kind of driving the point home about it, but. I don't agree with this assessment. Um, and essentially, you know, as we were already saying, you know, you adapt these technologies. You, you pointed out that they existed in the free market. That doesn't mean that they can't also be utilized in what we're talking about or even made more efficient, especially. Well, sorry, my argument is that they can't be utilized in what you're talking about. And saying that they can be is not rebutting the point, right? So if you say, well, these things can be taken over, which is very much against the economic argument, then you need to tell me how. Because, you know, that's like me, you know, saying uh, I put forward a business plan and they say, well, the, 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 the service that you uh, require doesn't exist and there's no possibility of it existing. And I say, no, 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 it will exist. Right. Nobody would accept that. And, and I view the Venus Project as the most astoundingly ambitious, which is not to say wrong or false or anything, but the most astoundingly ambitious entrepreneurial project the world has ever seen. Because you're talking about reorganizing the economy of six billion people in the entire planet. And so I can't be satisfied with answers like, no, 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 it was developed in the free market and it completely relies on price. But once we get rid of the free market and we get rid of prices, it will still work fine. That's not an argument. That's just an assertion. What I need is some tangible uh, proof of, of how it's going to work or okay, at least an well, argument. No, and I understand. I've, I've basically have tried to do that for you. I, I don't know why you're not satisfied, but I can elaborate on it more. Um, one, one of the things that you know, goes into all of this is that right now, as you pointed out, things are calculated and they're determined according to the price system. Okay, um, The price system has a lot of anomalies in it, not the least of which being profit. 
um, that obviously the person producing an item needs to try to get something more out of it than they put into it. And none of those things need to be necessary anymore. What exactly would stop us from just calculating the resources involved, you know, based on that and take the profit element out of it and just produce things, you know, essentially beyond wholesale, produce things exactly what they're needed for and then go from there, you know. It, okay, so so you want to calculate um, the 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 both the existing costs and the opportunity costs of of raw materials and and uh, services to create, say, a car. How are you going to calculate it? I, I well, that's what I was trying to say. I don't I don't feel that the calculations involved are really all that different, other than the fact that we're not calculating them with with uh, consumption in mind. We're cal calculating them with access in mind. Which makes it easier, you know. We're not calculating it based on what people want. That is not. It is generally based on irrationality, and we're not calculating it based on, um, you know, any need for anybody to get a benefit out of it beyond the fact that now we have a car available to people for people to use. I well, actually, I mean, see, and and Neil, this is where this is where I get a little frustrated with the Venus Project. So this thing's been floating around for forty years, right? And I think it's reasonable for people to say, you know, computers existed 40 years ago. The, I think it's reasonable for people to say, if you think you have an algorithm that replaces the personal economic decisions of 6 billion people, if you have an algorithm that can do that, tell us what it is. Because if you don't have one, then saying, well, we'll be able to calculate it, don't worry, cross your fingers, let's just ride off into the future to this uh, place which has led to disaster in terms of central planning and no prices in the past, saying we have a calculation, don't worry, to me is not sufficient to, to take the risk, if that makes sense. So if it's, you know, you've been talking about this calculation in the Venus Project for four decades, I think it's reasonable for people to ask, you know, let's open the kimono, let's look behind the green curtain and see what this algorithm is. If it's not there or not present or not figured out, that to me is a significant weakness, if not a complete undoing of the system. So, you know, once again, I ask you, rather than just saying, don't worry, we'll be able to calculate it, how does the calculation work? What are the algorithms? When you're asking for algorithms, are you asking me to throw mathematical equations at you or something? No, I mean, I explained the calculation problem without throwing mathematical equations at you. Uh, I think that, you know, there's been ample time and ample uh, opportunity. I mean, the Venus Project wasn't, didn't come around yesterday. There's been 40 years uh, with, this, uh, with the Venus people saying, we've got these, uh, this way of, of replacing the market system. And look, I mean, you understand, historically, uh, I'm not saying that it's exactly the same, but historically, when people get rid of private property, when people get rid of the market system, when people get rid of currency, uh, usually within two years, uh, people are starving to death. Uh, this has been the historical example. And again, I'm not saying that anybody on, on the, in the Venus Project wants people to starve to death. Or I, I, I have no doubt of, of the sincerely good motives of people on the Venus Project. However, the reality exists that in the past, when this has been tried, economically it has been a complete catastrophe, and there's lots of reasons for that, which we can go into if we really want to put your audience to sleep. But if you're <laughs> going to say, let's go back and try this thing called no property and no prices and no uh, no money. If, if you're going to say, let's go back and try this again, I need more than the magic word called computers and calculations to believe that the problem has really been thought through. I need to have some understanding of how goods are going to be allocated and how resources are going to be allocated other than, don't worry, there'll be a computer and some calculations. That, that That's not an answer. Well... First of all, um, I, I don't know. I I feel that I've answered you, but I mean, it, as far as you know, if you're still if you're still unsatisfied with the answer, that's fine. Um, I'm not a mathematician. That's not my area of expertise. But um, there are other people involved with this process. Like one of them right now is like spamming the chat. He's an engineer. Um, Bring him in. I would love to hear. <laughs> Look, and I say this out of passion for the solution. I say this not out of any sense of hostility. I mean, if there's an answer that's better than the price system. I'm all ears. I'm I'm for optimization. I'm for efficiency. I'm for getting as many resources into as many people's hands as humanly possible. If there's a way to do it that I'm not aware of or that you don't have the details of, you know, bring him in. Let's let's uh, let him school me. I would love to hear it. Okay, well that's fine. Um, I'm gonna actually ask him to come on via Skype right now. So, Doug, jump on Skype. <laughs> but um, in any case, uh. Overall, though, before we can get him on here, so we don't have like a oh he's got to call in via the phone number. Let me go ahead and put it in here. Um, hey Doug, it's well I'll just type it in the chat three four seven nine four five 
and then 7747. Anyway, I'll bring him on. Soon yeah, just as he's coming on. I mean, I, I hope that you're enjoying it. I certainly am, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate the the common ground that we found, and I certainly do appreciate the opportunity to speak to people in the Venus Project. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is um, uh, it is it is a wonderful thing to to speak to people as critical of the existing disasters and as enthusiastic about creative solutions as possible. So I just really wanted to thank you for the opportunity. No, that's fine. Anyway, um, well, in the meantime, while I'm waiting, just because it's going to be hard to know which one he is, <laughs> um, and, uh, I'll go from there. But, but basically, um, it's probably this latest one. I'm going to pull him on. And it may be worth, I mean, if, if you do have people who want to call in, I'm certainly happy um, for us both to field whatever uh, people have to uh, have to say, because, uh, you know, sure. this, this really should be a, a more collective uh, discussion. Yeah. Uh, Doug, did I just enable your mic? Is that you? Uh, I'm going to say that's a no. <laughs> Unless he's yelping something to us. I don't speak <laughs> Chihuahua. Yeah. Doug, uh, poodle, dog. yes, because I'm British, but not Chihuahua. <laughs> Doug, not dog. Um, <laughs> all right. Let me... Who let the dogs out? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Doug, is that oh, you? Nope, that's not dog. That's not Doug. Can you hear me? Now Try I can hear you. Again? What's up, Doug? All right, testing one, two. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> um, by the way, to the audience, this is Doug. He made the uh, brief film called Awakening. Um, he was a systems engineer for the space shuttle program. I still am, for as long as the space shuttle still exists. <laughs> All right, well, go ahead and uh, share with us, Doug, while I uh, continue this, because apparently my show says two minutes remaining, and I know that's wrong, but go ahead and talk with Stefan. You have two minutes to solve the entire planet's problems. Go! <laughs> All right, good. I could probably do that. The central computer system is not a control system. It's a data collection facility designed to take into account all of the natural resources of the planet so that you basically know what you have to work with. As far as who controls the distribution of resources, that's a misnomer based on the current system. Right now, who controls the distribution of resources? The companies and influences that go out, seek the land, mine the resources, create a product, and then sell it at some particular price. They 90 demand. Seconds. How is that demand derived in the first place? Uh, either it's done by a series of studies or uh, whatnot that judge if people want a particular product, how that product will work, look, demographic surveys, things like that. The exact same process would occur in a resource-based economy without the monetary price tag. You still conduct surveys. People still make notes of what they want. They can do it interactively and directly via online communication system. 60 Keeping seconds. Mind, the entire planet is now connected to the web, per se, or at least to their own local hub, their closest uh, production center, which would be the main cities. Uh, it's local production, local distribution, and a smaller geographic terrain, whereas today we make stuff on one side of the planet to send it to the other side of the planet and boiling a whole bunch of energy in the process, and energy equals money and cost. And if you can wipe all of that out and make everything a lot more local, you would drastically reduce the price model to the point to where it becomes negligibly irrelevant. And that's exactly what the RBE does, is it dwindles the price model down so far because of abundance, because of on-demand creation. In other words, if I want a chair, there aren't 10,000 chairs made sitting in a warehouse. I punch in what I want, when I want it, and the on-site local area production facility creates that product for me based on the resources that are readily available. And because we aren't making too much of anything and we're not making multiple demographic models of something for poor people, for middle-income people, for wealthy people, we're always just making the best, dim, the best levels of everything. You drastically reduce your resource waste and you incorporate all of your recycling principles into the system. You end up negating the entire need for a price system because people can get what they want when they want it. There's no price tag on that. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to go back to what you were saying. Were you saying that corporations control resource allocations? Yeah, pretty much that and governments combined. Well, I'm... I'm I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just curious if you've had any experience uh, creating products for consumers in a free market. Yes. As a matter of fact, I've uh, written a book, and that's a product that I created, and it's an on-demand book, basically. It's done through a self-publisher, and people, when they, if they want it, they 
select and they quote unquote buy it at a particular price, and then the company actually manufactures it right then and there. They don't make a whole bunch of them. They do on-demand printing, and then they send it off to the person. Well, that's not the so most I sophisticated. Sorry to interrupt. That's not the most sophisticated. I'm not saying that any of this makes your argument incorrect, but that's not the most sophisticated coordination of resources. That's you writing and attempting to publish it. And the reason that I asked that is because it's not true, uh, economically speaking, it's not true that uh, corporations, and of course, I don't like corporations any more than your average uh, communist, not that I'm calling you a communist, because corporations are bizarre, horrible creations of, of government legal systems. But uh, corporations don't control uh, the the uh, utilization of resources. Uh, it is the consumer who directs the utilization of resources through the price mechanism. So, uh, if uh, if somebody creates an, an uh, if Apple creates an iPad, uh, they do so based upon uh, anticipation of consumer demand and how much consumers are going to pay for the iPad versus how much it costs to create it. And that's how they know whether they're satisfying demand in an efficient way or not. And it is the consumers who direct through the purchasing of various items. It is the consumers who direct corporations to pursue particular avenues of resource allocation and consumption. It's not the consume. It's not the corporations that push products onto the consumers. I mean, if you just think of the failure of the Edsel and the failure of New Coke uh, as too highly advertised. I think Coke spent a hundred million dollars trying to advertise New Coke, and the product completely failed because, you know, people just didn't like it. Or the Edsel also had a huge yeah. advertising campaign that completely failed. It's not corporations that determine the allocation of resources. It is the consumers. And the only way that uh, corporations know or any entity knows whether or not to produce a particular good or service is because what the, the price the consumer is willing to pay for is greater than the cost of the resources to produce it. And without the price system, uh, there's no way to allocate these resources effectively. Okay, you just, in a way, you almost slightly contradicted yourself from what you said earlier in the show. When you said... Who, does, who dictates how the resources are distributed with the central computer and the RBE? And then you turn around now and say the people, the consumers are the ones who dictate how resources are allocated. By in, a, in a free market. Sorry, in a free market. They want. In, in a free That's market, exactly I'm talking about. exactly what the resource-based economy would be. The resource-based economy is a free market, the operative word being free. Nothing costs anything because the people demand or dictate what they want at their local area levels, and then that is what is produced to satisfy their needs. But it's done on a person-to-person -person basis. It's not so, done sorry, are you saying that, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I just want to make sure you said something quite startling to me, which is that nothing costs anything. No, it but, costs but, natural but, resources. That's what is measured and allocated, or not allocated, that's not the right word. That is what is accounted for is the the actual resources the natural resources themselves okay sorry Money well what did sorry I, again i just did, if you can the, just just help me with this i just want to make sure i understand this but when you said nothing costs anything what, what did you mean in other words it, you don't have to pay something to acquire a good or service in the resource-based economy because there's an abundance of it and it's and it's managed to the point scientifically to where the waste levels are so drastically reduced that there is no need to add a dollar sign to it to give it a perceived value. It has inherent value. Okay, so in a, uh, a resource-based economy, uh, I can want, uh, I can just say I want a car and a car will appear and I don't pay for any of it. You wouldn't have to say, I want a car. You could just go check one out. There's going to be entire centers dedicated to giving people the opportunity to use cars if they need them. But you've got to factor in also when you're thinking about that process that 99% of the time you're going to have access to amazing public transportation systems that are much more highly efficient than anything that we have going on today right now because the systems engineering will make it that efficient. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so so help me to understand this. In the absence of price, and again, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but this is the major part I can't understand, and I'm not trying to be difficult. I genuinely don't get it. When you use terms like efficient, those are terms that are very specifically economic terms, and they are to do with uh, it, it, everything requiring fewer resources to produce than people are willing to pay for it in order to consume. In other words, the car uh, costs you uh, 16,000 universal space credits or something to produce, and people find it worth uh, 17,000, and therefore it's worth, worth producing it because it's efficient. If it costs 16,000 universal space credits to produce and people are only willing to pay 10,000 for it, then it's not satisfying people's needs to the point where it's worth producing it. 
efficiency. That that is what is meant by economic efficiency. What is the definition for efficiency, and how do you know whether it's been achieved uh, in in the resource based economy? Hmm? Efficiency is not economic. Efficiency is scientific. There is a percentage. There is an efficiency rating that you can calculate for pretty much anything, thermodynamically, electrically, uh, materialistically, depending upon like the material needs and material quantifications, the tensile strength and things like that of a particular object. There is an efficiency number that can be assigned to those. It's taught to every engineer that comes to the basic curriculum. And so that's considering the RBE is the scientific method for social concern. Anything and everything that is created is made to the utmost efficiency of the knowledge of the time that that product was created for the people. In other words, it's designed to last as long as possible, to help as many people as possible. Of course, that depends. Ah, okay, on okay, good, good. You're See, uh, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so, so what you're saying is you're using the word efficiency in, in two different ways, at least to me. So the, the one is uh, efficiency in terms of low energy consumption and uh, well-lubricated parts and it lasts a reasonable amount of time, and that is engineering efficiency. But then you're talking about meeting people's needs or preferences which is more around economic efficiency. And the second one, to me, is not the same as the first, if that makes any sense. So my question is not, how do you make things efficient? Say you you know you want to build a car. How do you make that efficient from an engineering standpoint? I have no problem. That's a technical issue, which I have no issue with uh, that, that anybody can solve it. My question is, given the Earth's scarce resources, how are they to be allocated to satisfy people's preference and desires in the best and most efficient way in the absence of, of price allow and free to, trade? Allow me to interject a little bit here because I think that something that Doug pointed out is actually an excellent example and the reason why it is engineering is because you're engineering the situation so that people's needs are more easily satisfied even with a, with a minimum amount of production necessary rather than just sort of you know, waiting around for a politician to get around to installing effective public transportation. Public transportation is designed immediately into any given city or dwelling, um, therefore eliminating the need for something, for example, like cars. We actually think that cars will be, you know, only used when people need to get out of the city for one reason or another. That's an example of scientific applications to create an efficiency that eliminates a need. Rather than just, you know, it's it's not, this is another thing that's really important, and it's why I brought up a lot of that stuff earlier, is that we're not talking about just taking a capitalist situation and then turning it into an RBE. A lot of the, the situations that we're talking about, you know, will come from an infrastructure that is designed intelligently for the maximum efficiency of the use of resources and ensuring that everybody's needs are met. Will it work? I don't know. It depends on what other people do. Roxanne and I have no power. When you leave here, if you don't talk to people, nothing will happen, I can assure you. If a person says, it'll never work, well, show me where it won't work. Answer them, because we're interested. If you can find out what's the matter with it, where it won't work, do it.